Welcome to our White House COVID response press briefing. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Walensky, Dr. Fauci, and Dr. Nunez-Smith. I want to first provide an update on our vaccination program. Over the weekend, Washington state became the 13th state to reach the milestone of 70% of adults with at least one shot. I spoke with Governor Inslee, who conveyed that despite their great progress, the continued work needed to move the state back to normal. He, after all, governs the state where most of us witnessed the first major coronavirus outbreak last year. And I conveyed our complete support for the steps he's taking with regard to how he is managing the public health actions to bring the state back in as safe a way as possible. Now, every state has the ability to do what has been done in these 13 states, but there's no doubt that it takes work. That's why last week we launched the National Month of Action to help more states reach that milestone and get more people vaccinated. Over the weekend, volunteers across 45 states completed more than 500,000 phone calls, door knocks, or texts. The First Lady and Dr. Fauci visited a vaccination clinic in New York City where they met Annette, a 92-year-old woman who was there because her grandson convinced her and drove her to get the shot. If you don't have someone in your life to do that, don't worry. You can text your zip code to 438829 and get a free ride to and from a vaccination site. Uber and Lyft have already completed more than 150,000 free rides to help Americans get vaccinated. And this program will continue until July 4. And Dr. Nunez-Smith will have a further update on making transportation even more broadly available. Now, according to our surveys, many people say they would get a vaccine if they were able to do so around their working hours. So we are very pleased that effective immediately, the American Hospital Association has launched the capability to bring vaccinations directly to people's workplaces through their member hospitals. Employers can now email COVID-19 at aha.org and your business will be connected with a local provider who can work with you to host an on-site pop-up clinic and usually make it happen in a matter of days. Many states and many businesses have launched incentive programs and anecdotal reports are emerging that many of these are working well. Look at Jonathan Carlisle, an Amazon delivery driver from Toledo, Ohio. Here's what he said about getting vaccinated, and I quote, I kept hemming and hawing about it, and I work all the time. When Vaximilian, when this Vaximilian thing started, I immediately went down there and got it. It pushed me over the edge. Today, Jonathan Carlisle is on his way to being fully vaccinated. And he's a millionaire because he also won Ohio's Vaximillion. Safe from COVID and a millionaire. And Jonathan, it doesn't stop there. You're also eligible for a free beer from Anheuser-Busch on July 4. What a great country. And that's before even considering that Dr. Fauci and his team at the National Institutes of Allergies and Infectious Diseases helped invent and invest in the mRNA platform over the last two decades so that we would be ready in case the worst should happen. Jonathan, that's how you got your vaccine in the first place. So thank you, Dr. Fauci. Finally, many Americans say they will get vaccinated if one thing happens. They have a chance to talk to their physician and get their questions answered. So call your physician if you wanna know if you should get vaccinated. And if you don't have one, call a local hospital or clinic. Rather than wait for the call, The people at a company called Centene, an insurer that disproportionately serves lower income Americans, is initiating something highly innovative that I hope people follow, and so do they. They will launch a campaign to conduct vaccination education and outreach to 25 million Americans. More than half of them will get a call directly on their phone. And when Centene reaches someone who's unvaccinated, they will connect them to their physician directly and help them arrange an appointment. Kaiser Permanente is conducting a similar approach through email, texting, 
and direct mail. We do hope other organizations with broad reach directly into patient populations like this, follow their lead and contact people who are at risk because they don't have a vaccination and talk to them about the benefits of vaccination. These are all great examples about how this is not an effort to 70% that is being done by the government. It is being led by the American people and by constituents all around the country. Since today is my last briefing and tomorrow is my last day in the White House, I want to close by saying what a pleasure it has been not only to serve on the president's COVID response team, but to be able to help lead these briefings. We've aimed to follow the example of the president by presenting clear, straight answers to the best of our ability in a view of what we are seeing, whether the news is good or bad. It has been an honor to serve as part of an administration committed to working day and night until Americans are able to feel safe again from this pandemic, that the pandemic becomes highly manageable, that the economy is flourishing, and that we are on our way towards vaccinating the globe. But I'm even prouder to serve an administration that has been so deeply committed to showing our values in action every day, pulling everyone together and leaving no one out, empathetic to what ordinary Americans are going through and leading with equity at every turn. Even as so much of what we cherish is returning, we cannot let our progress be a reason for taking our foot off the pedal. Threats remain. We must push harder so more Americans can return to normal life and the peace of mind that comes with being vaccinated. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Walensky. Thank you, Andy. Uh, please know you will be deal dearly missed in this venue and across. Um, good morning to everyone. I'm pleased to be back with you today. As far as the data, yesterday, CDC reported just over 10,000 new cases of COVID-19. Our seven-day average is 13,277 cases per day, and this represents yet another decrease of nearly 30% from the prior seven-day average but most importantly, a 94% decrease from COVID-19 cases since January of this year. And the first time that the seven day average of cases has been less than 15,000 since March 27th, 2020. In other good news, the seven day average of new hospital admissions is just a bit over 2,200. That is a decrease of 83% in hospitalizations since January 9th of this year, when we peaked at over 16,500 average daily admissions. And finally, the seven day average of daily deaths remains at 379 per day. It gives me so much hope to report these declines in cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. It is in part a result of our ongoing efforts to vaccinate so many Americans. Each week, there are more and more data to demonstrate the impact a vaccination has on preventing disease and moving us out of this pandemic. Today, CDC published an MMWR that demonstrates how high vaccination coverage in older adults in the United States has served to reduce COVID-19 cases and severe outcomes. In this new CDC study, we looked at the rates of cases, emergency department visits, hospitalizations, and deaths across all age groups, both before and after the COVID-19 vaccine was available, from December 2020 to May 2021. We observed larger declines in COVID-19 cases, emergency department visits, hospitalizations, and deaths in adults over age 65 who were prioritized for vaccination in the early phases than in adults aged 18 to 49 who were less likely to be vaccinated. By comparing data from November and December of 2020 before vaccine rollout with data from April and May after vaccine rollout, and by stratifying the data by age groups, we were able to see the critical contribution of vaccination coverage on reducing COVID-19 cases, severe illness, and death, especially among those over age 65. As of today, we have administered over 300 million doses of COVID-19 vaccine. More than 85% of adults over age 65 have received at least one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine, and 75% are fully vaccinated and protected. Still, we have a lot more work to do. 
especially in younger age groups. Of Americans that qualify for a vaccine, those that are age 12 and over, we have been able to vaccinate 50% of the country. This is great news, but there is more work to be done. During this pivotal month of action, if you are not vaccinated, please go to vaccines.gov, test text your zip code to get vax or 438-829 or talk with your healthcare provider, state or local health department or, or local pharmacist to find out more about getting vaccinated. And if you've gotten your first dose of Pfizer or Moderna, don't forget to get your second, either three or four weeks later. I'll stop here and turn things over to Dr. Fauci. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Dr. Walensky. Um, before I start, let me just underscore what Dr. Walensky said about how much we will miss Andy Slavitt. Andy, you are a class act and we will miss you greatly. What I'm gonna do right now is spend the next couple of minutes talking to you about a subject that has gained a lot more attention over the last few days. And that has to do with the variants in general, but particularly in the variant, which we now refer to as Delta, or the B1617.2, which in fact, as you know, originally was noticed in India and dominated in certain states in India, but now has spread throughout other elements and other areas of the world. Next slide. So let's just take a quick look at that. It's reported in 60 countries, including the UK and the USA. Clearly now its transmissibility appears to be greater than the wild type namely the alpha variant. It may be associated with an increased disease severity, such as hospitalization risk compared to alpha. And in lab tests associated with modest decreased neutralization by sera from previously infected and vaccinated individuals compared to the alpha. However, fortunately, two doses of the Pfizer vaccine and AstraZeneca appear to be effective against the Delta variant. There's reduced vaccine effectiveness after one dose, however, and I'll get back to that in a moment. Next slide. This is a publication from what I had mentioned to you at a previous briefing from Public Health England, and it has to do with the effectiveness of the COVID-19 vaccines against this Delta variant. Just to reiterate, Two weeks after the second dose of the mRNA Pfizer BioNTech, it was 88% effective against the 617. And just like we've shown multiple times, over 93% effective against the B117. Take a look at the last bullet. Three weeks after one dose, both vaccines, the AZ and the Pfizer BioNTech, were only 33% effective against symptomatic disease from Delta. Clearly important about why a second dose is so important. Next slide. Now, what about what's going on in the UK and why should we learn lessons from this and always getting back to the situation of why it's so important to be vaccinated? In the UK, the Delta variant is the rapidly emerging as the dominant variant, greater than 60%. It is replacing the B117. The peak transmission in my conversations with and the data associated with e the UK when talking to their health authorities, the transmission is peaking in the younger group of 12 to 20 year olds. Namely, that group that we're concerned about here, about making sure they get vaccinated. And as I mentioned before, there's poor protection after a single dose of either the mRNA or AZ vaccine. Next slide. This slide graphically demonstrates in the darker part of the slide, the red, the emergence of the B16172 compared to the lighter pink, which was the original B117. It's essentially taking over. Last slide. So let's look at where we are in the United States. That variant, the Delta variant, currently accounts 
for more than 6% of the sequence cases in the United States. This is a situation the way it was in England, where they had a B117 dominant and then the 617 took over. We cannot let that happen in the United States, which is such a powerful argument to underscore what Dr. Walensky said. To get vaccinated, particularly if you've had your first dose, make sure you get that second dose. And for those who have been not vaccinated yet, please get vaccinated. This is the national month of action. We want to get to and above the goal of 70% of the adult population receiving at least one dose by the 4th of July. I'll stop there and over to you, Dr. Nunes Smith. Hey, thank you so much, Dr. Fauci, and good morning to everyone. You know, as we know, for our national vaccination campaign to be successful, everyone, everyone in our country needs to benefit from the scientific discovery with the vaccines. We absolutely cannot beat this virus without making sure there's a plan that works for everyone and works for all communities. So to ensure that we are truly reaching everyone who is unvaccinated in this phase of our vaccination program in this month of action, we are working hard and continuing to make progress in addressing the structural barriers that many people face in terms of access. We're focusing even harder on meeting people exactly where they are. And we will continue to provide the public with the answers that you need about getting vaccinated. It is our pledge to make sure that vaccination is easy and convenient for everyone. So we've increased the number of pop-up and mobile units across the country. We've ensured that the majority of our 40,000 participating pharmacies are located in areas that are at higher risk. We understand not everyone can operate on a nine to five schedule, as Andy said. So pharmacies are now accepting walk-in appointments and have extended their hours. Starting this week, thousands of pharmacies nationwide will stay open late every Friday in June and will offer the services throughout the night to make sure individuals can get their shot. We already see the difference our pharmacy program is making to close the equity gap. Over the last two weeks, half of pharmacy doses have been administered to people of color. And our community health center program remains another trustworthy, available option for neighborhoods across the country. They are also closing the equity gap. About 70% of shots through the federal community health center program have been administered to people of color. Still, when talking to those who are unvaccinated, I often hear many of the same reasons for why they have yet to get a shot. Many, many people have concerns about missing a day of work, about paying for childcare, or about how they will travel to and from a vaccination site. For individuals and communities facing greater degrees of socioeconomic disadvantage, those who can't afford to miss a day or two of work, they can't afford unplanned, unexpected childcare or travel expenses. You know, risking a shockwave through a family's finances is just not tenable. So the COVID-19 response team has focused on addressing each of these barriers, paid time off, childcare, and transportation. First, last month, the president announced a tax credit to fully reimburse employers, those with fewer than 500 employees, that provide paid time off for vaccination and any side effects. And he called on every employer in the country to do the same. And second, last week, the president announced that through July 4th, the nation's largest childcare providers will offer free childcare to parents and caregivers getting vaccinated and anybody recuperating from vaccination. The Department of Health and Human Services also issued guidance encouraging all states to use funding from the American Rescue Plan to support local and home-based providers who wanna join the effort. And third, Uber and Lyft providing free rides to vaccination sites through July 4th. And just today, the Department of Transportation announced that more than 350 transit agencies across the country are also offering free rides to vaccination sites. We want to give everyone in the country as many free transit options as possible by subway, bus, ride share. There are multiple ways to get to and from your shot for free. 
And many of these public transit efforts are supported by the American Rescue Plan, which has provided more than $30 billion in support for transit agencies. And several of these transit agencies are in hard hit and high risk communities with lower vaccination rates. You know, in Florida, the Jacksonville Transportation Authority has partnered with Agape Family Health to launch Wheels to Wellness, a mobile vaccination clinic used in transit buses in areas with gaps in equity. Transit agencies in both urban and rural communities across the country have also waived fares to vaccination sites. In rural South Central Texas, Spartan Public Transit has provided free bus rides to appointments and assigned staff to help residents find the nearest vaccination site accessible by transit. And since April, Pueblo Transit in Colorado has offered free bus rides for all residents to the FEMA Community Vaccination Center at the Colorado State Fairgrounds. These local efforts are incredible and we encourage everyone in these communities, please take advantage of them. And today we are calling on every governor and local leader across the country to ensure that your state, county, city, or town provides at least one free, accessible public transit and paratransit opportunity for your constituents during this month of action. And the Federal Transportation Authority will support your transit agency's vaccination efforts by awarding grants to cover 100% of these expenses. So as I said earlier, we absolutely cannot beat this virus without making sure there's a plan that works for all communities and for everyone to get vaccinated. We've made incredible progress. Getting vaccinated now is easier than ever. You can text your zip code, as you've heard, to 438829. You will be given the addresses of those vaccination sites, the three closest to you, but you will also be asked whether you're in need of childcare or transportation support during your vaccination. So the Biden-Harris administration is committed to addressing barriers and we're not gonna leave anyone behind in this response. So thank you, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Andy and also add my gratitude to you for your service and you will be missed, my friend. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nunez-Smith. Kevin, let's take some questions. All right, first question, let's go to Dave Shepardson at Reuters. Uh, thank, uh, thanks for uh, thanks for that. Uh, two uh, two quick questions, Dr. Wolenski, Has the CDC decided whether to let the residential eviction ban expire on June thirtieth? And and can you talk a bit about you know the ongoing discussions about the two twelve F restrictions? Uh, given that some countries now have higher rates of infections um, that do not have any restrictions, and some countries are still covered that have very low rates. Is it time to, to rethink the 212F? Uh, thank you for those questions, Dave. The, um, we are in uh, discussions about what will happen with the eviction order for when it expires, so I don't have any updates there. With regard to 212F, this, of course, is an interagency conversation, and we are looking at the data in real time um, as to how we should move forward with that. Um, and so, in, and in, for, in fact, you know, as you heard from Dr. Fauci earlier, as we look at those conversations, as we have those conversations, we need to include data regarding regarding where things, um, there are more cases and data related to variants. Ongoing conversations, thank you. Next question. Ebony McMorris at the American Urban Radio Network. Hi, thank you. Um, this is for Dr. Walensky. Um, with, in the African American community, there's still only 25% that have received just on one vaccination shot. And I know the president rolled out, you know, the, the national month of action. However, how is that correlating now? What is the response that you are seeing? And the second part to that is, um, I hear what you're doing with employers. Is there also a push to, um, work with black churches in the community to maybe do some on-site vaccinate vaccination since that's also um, a center organization within black communities. Dr. Nunez Smith, do you want to take that or you'd like me to? Yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely happy to, to speak to, to that. Um, and thanks for the question. You know, we remain, uh, you know, across the entire government, extremely committed and centered on equity in the response. Um, we know that there is still much work to do despite the progress that we've been discussing. You know, to your first point around um, the numbers and the data, you know, fortunately we still 
are dealing with challenges in the completeness of our data. So it's hard to know exactly in terms of those numbers, but we are pushing absolutely the comprehensive efforts um, to make sure that we meet people where they are, that we address all the structural barriers. And to your key point, that the partnerships are deep with uh, community leaders, faith-based leaders, organizations. And so there are indeed efforts and, and you're right, have been extremely successful in partnering with houses of worship, the black church, the president also announced a new initiative, Shots at the Shop, partnering with barbershops and beauty salons. So making sure that we connect people, it's easy, it's convenient, people have their questions answered. And, and maybe uh, I'll just add that CDC has toolkits available for all of these local settings. If um, there's a faith-based organization that wants a toolkit for how to get engaged, we have those, those uh, toolkits available, uh, same with community-based organizations. With regard to on-site vaccination, just to mention, Andy, as you said yesterday, I had the privilege of being with and and uh, and uh, Sunday with the first lady when we visited the Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem. And as far as on-site vaccinations in the basement of there, they had everything set up with registration, pre-counseling, vaccination, observation. It looked like a veritable clinic, and that was within the Abyssinian Baptist Church in the middle of Harlem. So it is happening in sight. Great. Um, let's go to the next question. Jeannie Bauman at Bloomberg. Hi, thanks so much for taking my question. Um, Dr. Fauci, I was wondering, I know NIH is working on um, boosters for the very, for the B135. And I was wondering, given what you just were talking about with the Delta, if um, the lab is working on those boosters as well. Um, as yet, there is not a trial that is specific uh, in the sense of variant specific uh, boost. You know, we did it with others, but not that. Importantly, uh, Jeannie, I want to point out that there are two ways to approach boosting. One is boosting against the original wild type for which a person was originally vaccinated. And the other is a variant specific boost. We are approaching both of those, but the one thing that we are noticing that's important is that the higher your degree of immune response against the wild type, the greater the secondary coverage you have against a wide array of variants, which is the reason why, as we have uh, reported, in previous press briefings, that when you look at particularly the double doses, uh, primary and boost of the mRNA vaccines, which we have the most data, there is rather good protection that spills over against multiple variants. So you can boost against the wild type and still cover variants, including 617. So the answer is yes, we're studying it definitely from a boost to the wild type. We haven't yet done a study against the 617, but I believe we will get protection heightened by a boost against the wild type. All right, next question. Meg Tyrell at CNBC. Well, thanks. Um, I wanted to ask about the uh, release from Governor DeWine in Ohio yesterday. Um, he said that there are about 200,000 doses of the J&J &J vaccine in the state, which will expire on June 23rd if they're not used. And he pointed out there's no legal way for them to share the vaccine with other states or countries. Uh, I just wondered if there are any solutions for that, if the state itself can't use those doses to get them to a place that could use them before they expire. And separately, I also wanted to ask uh, just for some reflection uh, on the importance of trials in kids under age 12 with Pfizer starting its phase two, three in kids ages five to 11 today. And the fact that they're testing such lower doses, 10 micrograms, and then for even younger kids, three micrograms, which is a third and a 10th of the adult dose. If you could just comment on um, the significance of that lower dose for kids and, and the significance of these trials in general. Thanks. Why don't I take the uh, question about Ohio and Dr. Fauci, uh, if you don't mind, to take the question about the dosing uh, and the trials for uh, younger children. Um, so look, our first goal and our first uh, opportunity is that 
every dose that's been ordered by a governor in a state gets used. Um, there are plenty of people um, across the country in every state that still haven't been vaccinated, that are eligible, that are at risk and need to get vaccinated. Um, there is a very, very small fraction of doses that have been sent out to states um, that will ultimately not be used. This will be, these will be fractional amounts um, and really will not have any significant bearing on our ability to commit to distribute vaccines globally. We are gonna be distributing as the president committed by the end of July, 80 million doses globally. Uh, and we have, um, you know, can, as the president has said, uh, we are going to make this country a hub of activity of manufacturing, distribution, promotion of vaccines in far greater numbers. So um, we, uh, we would also, final small point is would encourage every governor um, to, uh, who has doses that they worry may be expiring to work with the FDA directly um, on the proper storage procedures as we continue to examine, as they continue to examine processes that will allow the doses to potentially last longer um, as they go through those trials. Uh, Dr. Fauci, do you want to take the other piece? Yes, thank you, Andy. Uh, a, a good question. Uh, the idea of when you're going from an adult trial with adult doses, we do standard. This isn't anything unusual. What's called an age de-escalation and a dose de-escalation study, where you actually go from 12 years to nine, nine to six, six to two, and then six months to two years, and when you get down to the younger children, it is not at all unusual to diminish the dose, as you pointed out, when it goes down to 10, and then when you go down even lower to three, which is entirely compatible with the way you do both age and dose de-escalation studies. Next question. Caitlin Collins, CNN. Thanks very much. Andy, just one quick question to follow up on what you just said. You said that the doses are supposed to be out the 80 million by the end of July. I just want to confirm that it's supposed to be the end of June, right? And then my other question, just to follow up on the J&J &J doses, you said it's a small fraction that is set to expire, but the Wall Street Journal says it's millions of doses that are set to expire by the end of the month. So even if these states and these governors are contacting the FDA, what is the federal government's plan to make sure that you know not even a single dose goes to waste? Um, yeah, so so I, I believe you're right uh, about June, but and I may have been confused, so we'll get we'll make sure that um, we're certain that out. The um, look, it's it's not realistic to expect that not a single dose um, will go to waste. Um, I would tell you that a very very small fraction of the doses that have been sent to states that are in the hundreds of millions. Um, will end up not being used. Uh, remember, those doses were ordered by states, delivered by states, and should end up in people's arms. Uh, and we are working aggressively through this month of action and other steps to try to get those doses into arms. But inevitably, um, you know, you would, you would, in looking at this, Caitlin, you would choose speed over making sure that every single dose um, got into someone's arms and wasn't wasted. You would choose equity over making sure that there wasn't a single wasted dose. Those are values we've continued to prioritize, speed and equity as the most important things. And that means that inevitably, um, there will be situations where that will happen. Now, again, the FDA is looking at opportunities for continued storage. And we, of course, are continuing to look at opportunity for continued delivery of those doses. So my advice, you wanna win a million bucks, go get vaccinated and we can use these doses. I think I answered all your questions, Caitlin, I believe. If I didn't, please let me know. Uh, but if not, uh, Kevin, back to you for another question, if there is one. Let's go to last question, Zeke at AP. Um, thanks for doing this. Um, I was hoping, uh, Dr. Fauci, you might be able to weigh in on the, on the potential consequences uh, of the U.S. falling short of the of the president's 70 percent vaccination target uh, by July 4th. Is there a practical impact uh, for the country at large? And then specifically to uh, those states and communities where the vaccination rate uh, you know, isn't just close to 70, it's you know, significantly short of, of, of that threshold. What are the real world impacts uh, for those communities uh, that have not been able to drive vaccination up? And then uh, 
Uh, just to, sorry, one follow up to Andy. You just suggested that you know those were states ordered those doses, and and, and it's you know, it's on them to deliver. Are states not doing their part in some of these uh, areas where the vaccination rate isn't high enough uh, to get those doses in, in, in their arms? And is there more those states should be doing? Well, let me take the first part of it, Zeke. Uh, good question. When when goals are set, they're set to be able to stimulate us to get to that goal. If you don't meet the precise goal and you fall short by a few percent, that doesn't mean you stop in your effort to get people vaccinated. We have always held that July 4th is not the end of it. We want to reach 70% of the adult population by the 4th of July. I believe we can, I hope we will. And if we don't, we're gonna to continue to keep pushing. As you know, this is the month of action for what we're doing and we're putting a lot of effort into it. When you ask about the consequences, Zeke, it gets back to what we have said all along, literally almost every single time we've had a briefing, why it's so important. And you're right, there are some states that are falling well below the 50%. And those are the states that we are, in many respects, I use the word, almost pleading with them on the basis of what I showed in my presentation just a few minutes ago, of why it is so important to get vaccinated. And if we can galvanize that group that still, for one reason or other, does not want to get vaccinated, we can reach the 70 and go well beyond it as we get into the summer. So the consequences, we all know it's a fact. If you don't get vaccinated, you are at risk. If you get vaccinated, you dramatically, dramatically diminish the risk of getting infected and almost eliminate the risk of serious disease. Why it's so, so important for all of us to seriously consider vaccination if you have not already been vaccinated. And Andy, back to you. Yeah, see, to your, to your other question, uh, you know, re re remember that not so long ago, we were in a much more acute phase of this crisis, um, governors, um, were doing their jobs as the best they could, ordering as many doses uh, as they felt they needed to be able to combat this very significant threat. Uh, and as we've seen, uh, um, the vaccines that have been distributed have done their jobs uh, as they should. But in places where we haven't reached that goal yet, uh, we remain very focused on helping those states. So I would not say uh, that we feel like someone hasn't quote unquote done their jobs, Zeke. I would say we feel like it is hard work and all the things you hear Dr. Nunez-Smith talking about um, and other people who get on to these calls uh, and all of the initiatives that we announce uh, that we're working on um, are because it is hard work and we are prepared to work with any state and every state to make sure that every last person has an opportunity to be vaccinated because it is so important and it is such an important focus. Well, thank you again for uh, the, the question and uh, a final thanks to um, all the press uh, for attending these briefings and in helping us inform the public. And uh, we will look forward to the following, the next briefing. Thank you very much.